This is Climate Conversations, a podcast by ClimateX, the online community building a movement to solve our climate crisis. Hello and welcome to Climate Conversations. I'm Rajesh Kasirangan. Hi, and I'm Laura House. I also work at ClimateX, and I guess I'm here in the function of someone who's immensely interested in climate change, but not necessarily the technical educational aspect of it. And I'm Kurt Newton. I work at MIT's Office of Digital Learning, and I'm on the ClimateX team. And I often play kind of the, the climate wonk. <laughs> <laughs> I, like to, I like to get into them details. Details, details. Um, talking about details, I want to talk about fly swatting. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> We've had some interesting conversations going on recently. Yeah, uh, about whether we need to be confrontational, especially when it comes to market forces. Yeah, market forces has been a running theme, it seems, on the ClimateX platform. And no surprise, because market forces are unquestionably a running theme out in the wide world as well and driving so much of what happens or does not happen in regards to climate action. Yeah, and some of us think that we should be bludgeons and others think that we should carry flowers <laughs> and come to ClimateX and tell us what you think. Yeah, I, I have to be honest with you. I I think maybe it's my nature to be a confrontational person, so I'm kind of more of a bludgeon approach. Like, if people aren't willing to listen to the softly softly, then uh, maybe the more aggressive approach is, is what's necessary. But it's kind of drawing a line as to when we actually get there. Like, what is the point at which we have to accept that people aren't listening? Yeah. I mean, I definitely am on the bludgeon side, <laughs> but I do think that one can be a tofu bludgeon, as I called it. <laughs> yeah. I, for me personally, I got to weigh in as well. Um, I think there's a there's a place for bludgeons and a place for, you know, the, uh, I'm not even going to have a fly swatter, you know, the, the, the fly cage, the, <laughs> fly cage. <laughs> the engagement. Right. And um, so where do you decide those two places are? Like, how yeah. would you make that distinction? I'm not sure that there's there's a line that needs to be drawn as often as we might think. So my thought, thought on it is as the climate movement really becomes a movement, as mm -hmm. it becomes central to world politics, it's going to take every type. Right? Yeah. There will be, like you cannot have a movement with one voice. A movement by nature has many many voices. You need the uh, you need the aggressive folk out there with their bludgeons, kind of pushing really hard and you need the softly softly approach as opposed to bring in the moderates the people that are willing to listen that are a little bit more closer to that line of okay I, I kind of I understand climate change but I'm not quite sure how I should act or can act or whether it's a priority for me in my life yeah you hear some stories of people who've been actually quite successful in quiet advocacy that mm. one of the things they hear from the people that they're working with is thank god you're not you know screaming outside my door and I think there's actually there's a there's a relief that comes, but it's a necessary thing. That yep. like, if it wasn't for the people screaming outside the door, that <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't seem feel so, reasonable. so good. That's that's exactly right. And yeah, I, I think absolutely. there's a role for all these voices. It yeah. happened actually quite a lot in the anti-globalization movement, right? That there were people in the room and there were people screaming outside the room. And there doesn't have, I mean, you don't need to have coordination between the two. It's almost organic. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, the movement needs both. No, you're absolutely yeah. right. So we'd love to hear from you, ClimateX members and listeners, who <laughs> uh, please come to uh, to the ClimateX website and, and join the conversation about this. Yeah, we're at climatex.mit.edu. Uh, we've got some good conversations going on right now about how we should, you know, tackle this problem. Do we go for the bludgeon? Do we go for the fly swatter? And we'd love to hear what you think. Me and Radesh will be there with our bludgeons in hand. <laughs> and, and, a, and a hug, a and big a hug. hug for everybody. A hug -gen. A hug, Jen. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this week, we have a really inspiring person in our studio, Timothy Gay, who is a science teacher at the Boston Latin School and the founder of climatecurriculum.com. What do you think, Kurt? Yeah, you know, it's a little different from the, the first few guests we've had on the podcast who come from the university environment. But, hey, this is an educational institution here at MIT, and we really, really care about what's going on with the uh, the younger generation as well. And and Timothy appeals to me so much as like, I mean, I'm an ex high school teacher. So listening and getting to learn from someone who is a high school teacher and understands the importance of climate change and is able to then 
you know, really reach all those students is, is I'm very excited. I can't wait. Yeah. You know, the, uh, I think that young people are actually really, really smart about this stuff. And we should, we would all do well to, uh, to hear their voices. And, and so, they're uh, picking up the ball that we drop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Smash. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So moving on to Timothy Gay. So, Kurt, you know, I've been thinking, I feel like we are going to pass on a sort of a terrible inheritance to our children, and that is climate change. Yes. And it really sort of sometimes does keep me awake at night that my daughter is going to have to deal with things that we did not deal with. Yep. Yep. And that's why I think it's so important to engage with people who are passing on the right values to children. Right. And when we do that, when we bring up, uh, I, ideally we want a new generation that has a very, very different attitude to climate change than we do. Yep. And with that thought, I would like to introduce Timothy Gay, science teacher at the Boston Land School and founder of the Climate Curriculum. Thank you, welcome. Yeah, it's uh, great, great of you to join us. Thank you, I appreciate being here. Yeah. So, Timothy, tell us who you are, how you got here, and what do you want to do? <laughs> um, so, my name is Timothy Gay. I, I'm a science teacher at Boston Latin School. Um, always been interested in the sciences. Uh, I studied chemistry in grad school and uh, loved the research aspect, but, you know, got a chance to teach a few courses here and there. And, um, you know, that's when I made the very difficult decision in life to leave the laboratory and head off to the classroom because I found it a bit more engaging. Um, to work with students. So, you know, for the past 11, 12 years, I've been teaching in the Boston Public School System. And, you know, more recently, I've started a project where I'm trying to recruit teachers to participate and recruit other folks to work with me as we try to, you know, teach the proper science about climate change to students all across the country. Yeah, it's a really impressive uh, what you've done with, with climatecurriculum.com, just to put it out there for people. You um, should check it out, even while you're listening to this podcast or definitely afterwards. It was through that project that I first learned of you. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say right off the bat, um, way to go. Really impressive. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. yeah. So how many teachers have you reached so far? Um, it's been really interesting because the project started off with probably about, you know, 10 or 12 of us working together last summer to put lessons together to start this sort of project. And um, since then, I've had teachers from across the country get into contact with me. Um, I just received an intern coming up for the, the, the fall semester. I'll have a student working with me to help me um, write lessons. To yeah, to have an intern means you've arrived because <laughs> yes. that is, that is <laughs> the way the world is working now. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> So this intern presumably will be writing syllabi, or is it actual course? Uh, I will oversee the writing of curriculum. It almost um, it helps me in the sense where I kind of have the expertise to put it together, but not necessarily all the time and mm -hmm. um, resources. So essentially, I'll have someone that I will be mentoring write lessons that will help populate the curriculum. So how does this work with, you know, all the standards and the rules and regulations? So tell us, you know, the mechanics. Yeah, so no, it's a great question. You know, um, especially in Massachusetts, teachers are held to a very high standard to make sure that the proper science is taught in all the science classrooms to make sure that if a student in Western Mass or a student in Boston is taking a course in chemistry or biology, that they are learning the same material. And more recently, there's been an overview and revision of the curriculum standards they're called for Massachusetts and they've begun to include climate change as part of that. So that's a major deal here in Massachusetts is that we have that as part of our um, state curriculum frameworks. How does it uh, compare uh, Massachusetts with say other states around the United States and, and even <laughs> outside of the United States? What have you learned? It's, uh, yeah. it's very interesting. Um, Idaho, uh, back in March, was a state the, um, the lawmakers decided that they were going to remove climate change from their science curriculum because um, they don't feel like it's an important issue. Some other interesting information, I guess, and, and I guess this is just at the root, I think, of what you were discussing in the beginning part of this podcast about, you know, why this problem exists is because there's so much money in the disinformation campaign about climate change that, you know, the only political party in the entire planet uh, that does not believe in climate change is the United States Republican Party. 
Yeah. Did you get one of those uh, Heartland Institute books? I absolutely did. Yeah. Um, it was funny because uh, many of my colleagues at Boston Latin School also received the book, and they came running right to me because they know I'm fascinated with climate change, and they said, can you believe this? You know, we, you know, climate change is a myth, according Maybe to the Heartland Institute. People may not be familiar with what that book was, if you can remind us. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, it was essentially, it was a book that was published, and it's, it's, it's glossy, it's very well put together, it looks like it's an actual science publication, but it was published by the Heartland Heartland Institute, and if, if you're not familiar with the Heartland Institute, they're the ones who are always, you know, finding a scientist to sell their credentials to be on the wrong side of information. You know, right. essentially the, you know, secondhand smoke doesn't cause cancer, or CFCs aren't uh, causing a hole in the ozone layer is the side of the argument that those folks tend to um, gravitate towards. So now they've put this publication out to, I believe it was around 20,000 science teachers across the country. So that, oh. more like stake through the heartland. <laughs> 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 right. Reflecting back on our past conversation. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> yeah. So I believe that you have a group of students who've been working with you on this curriculum. Can you tell us a little bit about exactly what that looks like? Absolutely. So I work with a group of students. They are part of the Boston Student Advisory Council. So they come from all the different high schools throughout the city, and they are a group of activists. And these students advocate for change. They've been working really hard for student rights, and they've been working really hard for proper funding of the Boston Public Schools. And one of their projects that recently picked up was devoted towards climate change. And one of the really interesting stories for me, at least, when I talk to the students of why they care about climate change is many of them, it, it all started with one conversation of when did you first learn about climate change? And, you know, it seemed like all the students had different answers. You know, some maybe had a teacher that talked about it in elementary school. Some maybe didn't hear about it until high school even. So that conversation is what really started this movement of well, why doesn't everybody learn about climate change at the same time? Why, why isn't this part of a, a, a bigger issue? So I got a chance to work with these kids. They're great. You know, they're so full of energy. They're so hopeful. They, they really want to enact change. So, you know, we got together and we refined lessons. I took student feedback. Um, I believe right now students are working across the city on providing uh, background information for the science teachers. So essentially what they're doing right now is they're trying to compile peer-reviewed scientific research that can be then embedded into the background information for the science teachers. So when they do get a chance to look at these lessons, now they have sources of information for them. So the kids are very dedicated towards you know, making sure this information is spread out to as many people as possible. Wow, that's fantastic. So let me ask you a further question. Is this normal, meaning if they want to, if you want to teach physics or or chemistry, so a well understood subject, do you still do the same thing? Involve students, or is this special to climate change? I think this is pretty special to climate change for sure. Um, it's a scientific issue that I think many of the students gravitate towards. I think many of them stay on the positive aspect of things because they're always looking for solutions. They try not to get bogged down into the you know doom and gloom that typically comes along with a lot of these climate change issues. Yeah. Um, People from outside of Boston may not be familiar with with your school, Boston Latin School, but it's a it's like the high end, most sort of high performing uh, public school in the city. Wondering if if you have thoughts that can kind of put that community in perspective with, say, a, a more typical uh, public school. Yeah, I mean, uh, at Boston Latin School, for certain, I mean, it's the oldest public high school in the country. It was founded in 1635. Um, I mean, I, I should know how many of the signers of Declaration of Independence went to our school, but I forget. Um, yeah, it's like the it's like the uh, the public school predecessor to Harvard, right? Right. <laughs> right. And um, kids have to pass an exam in order to gain entrance, and they have to have a certain GPA. So these are you know it's it's essentially a school for the gifted and talented. So at Boston Latin School, you've got a a, a group of students who are particularly um, motivated. Correct. Perhaps. Um, what what do you think the situation might look like in in a in a more typical public school somewhere else outside of uh, the Massachusetts uh, blue bubble? Good question. Yeah. Um, I, unfortunately, and from the article that I've read that you know really kind of inspired me to put this climate curriculum together, um, they surveyed science teachers from across the country about how well they teach climate change, and the results were rather startling that many of the teachers don't. This is the Science Magazine article? Correct. And we'll put a link to that on our on our. Uh, yeah, on our Climate page. Confusion Among U.S. Teachers, I think is the title yes. of it. Yeah. yeah. And um, 
I mean, essentially, teachers across the country aren't teaching climate change for a number of reasons. It's whether they don't know well enough about it themselves or potentially uh, pushback from parents or other administrators in the community that don't necessarily agree with climate change. So there's, um, you know, a big gap in the science education across the country. So I think it's important that climate change becomes part of that. So you mentioned pushback. Correct. Have you received any? Um, Directly. (laughs) (laughs) Surprisingly not. The parents at Boston Latin um, have been very receptive to all the lessons we we have been giving. The last parent-teacher conference I had, you know, we have a very short window of time to talk to all the parents, so I usually give a very brief presentation to them about the course. And, you know, at at the end of one of them, and it was a really eye-opening experience for me, but one of the parents said, Jesus, class sounds so depressing, you know, (laughs) like, because I said, oh, we talk about, you know, deforestation or sea level rise or forest fire spreading, you know, or the chemicals in the environment. And my kids coming home all (laughs) bummed out. Come on. (laughs) Exactly. But then I guess that was a, a, an eye opening moment for me to start focusing more upon the solutions to the problems as opposed to just these problems are terrible. So give an example of a hands on solution, perhaps that you worked on either with your students or with other teachers or both? Great. Um, One of the lessons in the curriculum is actually focused directly on the solutions. And um, there's a company called Mappedwell that is located, I I actually believe it's here in Massachusetts. It may even be in Cambridge, but they have mapped the roofs of every dwelling in Boston. So I have an assignment where the kids will log into Mappedwell and they will find their own home and they will determine what the cost of putting solar panels on their home would be, what's the financial incentive, what's the payoff time on the investment. And then additionally, there's a professor out at Stanford. His name's Mark Jacobson, and he works with the Solutions Project. And he has, and him and his team have basically plotted how each state in the United States, and now it's actually expanded to the entire world, where what those individual states or countries would have to do to convert to 100% renewable energy. And it's all based on localized solutions. So for instance, here in Massachusetts, we have tremendous offshore wind potential. So we should be building all these offshore wind farms so that Not we can- Not in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but as opposed to, you know, huge solar farms where we're, we're a little more land constrained. Correct. Yeah. yeah. You know, out in Arizona, it'd be great to create more, you know, solar farms because of their solar potential. So, and actually, believe it or not, nimbyism is something we have to talk about in the course. And, uh-huh. you know, I use the Cape Wind example as a stellar example of, you know, some potential renewable energy we could have had at this point in time. But, you know, some wealthy, beautiful people got together and didn't want those to be constructed. So, Wealthy, beautiful people. <laughs> uh, what do your students think about, like, how did they reason about these kinds of topics? Uh, believe it or not, it's rather inspiring. Um, I find that once we start to talk about these issues in the class, they they do focus on the solutions. There may be a bit of doom and gloom at first, but then it's like, all right, let's pull ourselves up from the bootstraps. What can we do about this? And I find that whether it's the students tweeting at me or emailing me or stopping me in class and saying, hey, I went to California over break or I was in Europe over break and you should have seen all the solar panels. You should have seen all the wind turbines, you know, that stuff's being done. We're, we're, we're working towards solving it, you know. So it is more of a mentality that this can be conquered and this can be defeated, but it's just a matter of putting the right policies in place. Yeah, I remember when my, uh, my kids were in elementary school, So my son was in fourth grade. That would have been, you know, the early 2000s. The environmental stuff that came up for him in elementary school was all about the rainforest. Right. You know, and and this seemed to be the situation, you know, you know, schools all over, all over the state. All my friends were getting the rainforest thing. (laughs) Um, Do you think climate change is becoming the thing, the environmental thing? Absolutely believe so. Yeah, Yeah. it's it's on the forefront. I mean, of most news sites. I mean, you can't escape it. I think every day there's usually something mentioned about, you know, was it the Larsen ice shelf that just, you know, broke off from Antarctica? It, It something relevant to our collective you know, culture is always focused on something with yeah. climate change. Yeah. Well, you know, around that era, uh, in malls all around the United States was a restaurant chain called the Rainforest Cafe. Yes. Are we going to head for the climate change <laughs> cafeteria? <laughs> well, someone climate figures cafe. out how to, <laughs> someone figures out how to make money doing it, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. I, I, actually, that is my worry, right? That it will become yet another boondoggle. <laughs> 
Well, if it's all locally sourced food there you go. and, you know, okay. organic, I think it's, you know, okay. Mm-hmm. We'll All right, that, I'll get I'll get my crossed. business plan there ready. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, so that that reminds me, I wanted to ask you about um, teaching climate change to different age levels. I know on climatecurriculum dot com, well, you come from a high school background. You've got stuff down to the elementary school level. And it, what's uh, what's a couple differences in how you would teach climate change to a really young person versus uh, you say uh, an adolescent? Yeah, that's a great question because. Um, you know, they keep me up with the 11th and 12th graders, so teaching something to a third grader would be a nightmare to me. I wouldn't know the first thing to do. Um, but working with the other teachers, I noticed that it's you got to start with, like, the big ideas at first, you know? So, for instance, if it was an elementary school, we could begin teaching the students about what a watershed is and then teaching about, say, maybe the watersheds around the city of Boston and how water flows and how it flows to the oceans and kind of leave it there, you know? And, and then the, the younger kids don't need to know about the doom and gloom aspect of stuff it's not going to work well yeah so it's all about connecting to your local environment and right just being able to follow that right and then i would say maybe you move up to the middle school level and then you start to talk about sea level rise and how that could potentially begin to affect things and then maybe have them look at how sea level rise might affect the city of boston which you know is part of one of the lessons we have and then maybe lastly when you get to the high school level you start to have them engineer solutions to the problem so you know kind of keeping that consistent theme from the younger grades to the older grades but building upon that previous knowledge cool. so is there a community of teachers in boston or perhaps in massachusetts who are building this kind of stack, right? Starting in elementary school, going all the way to high school, and sort of... Yeah, I mean, it's it's a common thing in the education realm. We call it vertical alignment. Uh-huh. Um, so it's something that you try to make sure that the same principles are touched upon in all grades, but that you're building as you go upwards. Um, it's part of the fellowship that I was working on recently, um, the Science Education Fellowship, which really kind of was the root of how climate curriculum came about. But um, I worked with other science teachers, and we would focus on how energy transfers in an ecosystem. And I saw how that works from the you know second or third grade level all the way up to my classes in AP Environmental Science. So you know, you pick a consistent theme and you look at it and how it can be taught differently to different age students. I'd like to hear about any of your prior students who've perhaps moved on and really taken on these issues in their post high school lives. It's a great question. So every single year when um, my seniors go off to graduate, I usually spend one class chatting with the seniors and, and chatting with the whole class so they can explain where they're going to college and what they're going to study. And more often than not, now I'm seeing students going into the environmental realm um, and primarily like environmental engineering. And uh, believe it or not, I had one student recently revisit from BU and she had graduated high school three years ago. So she's a junior and she's studying environmental policy. So I was so excited. I was like, you got to tell me all the secrets because (laughs) the only environmental policy I've ever learned that was successful was the Montreal Protocol, which banned the use of CFCs so that we didn't destroy the ozone layer. So I was like, Erin, tell me what's what, what else we have out there. What are your professors talking about? And she said nothing. She says that's all they ever referenced. Yeah. Oh. It's, 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 all, uh, it's all effort and teeth gnashing. Yep, right? it is. Yeah. If the policymakers would just listen to scientists a bit more. I, think I hear carbon be. pricing's pretty cool. <clears throat> <laughs> Wait, Kurt, is that something that you care about? Uh, it might be. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Timothy, t- you've been to some exciting events recently. Professional development. Professional (laughs) development events with people who might have invented the internet, Uh, (laughs) right? Uh, So tell us a little bit. Yeah, so I uh, I was very lucky to uh, go out into Seattle at the end of June, and I went to the Climate Reality Project conference, and it was a three-day conference that was hosted by Al Gore. And um, Al Gore was our primary leader the entire time. Uh, We had a great three days where I got to see some major activist work that had been going on out in the Seattle area, ways in which they've prevented, you know, coal distribution in certain native lands or, you know, not building a, you know, hydroelectric dam that would disrupt the flow of, you know, salmon migrating. And it was a chance for a 800 like-minded people to get together in the same room and exchange ideas and 
figure out ways for future collaboration and really kind of see the forefront of what's going on with climate change. You know, Al Gore's got his sequel coming out in about a week or so where the Inconvenient Truth sequel is going to come out. And, you know, he seems to be vindicated on a lot of those initial projections he made in the first film back in 2006. And there's this new phenomenon that's happening now in weather where he shows these atmospheric rivers, one of them's called the Pineapple Express. It comes from Hawaii and it hits uh, the western coast of the United States and it drops tremendous amounts of precipitation. He has these things I've never heard of until the conference. They're called rain bombs. And if you Google a rain bomb over, I think there's one great one on Tucson, it literally looks like a giant bucket of water bouncing off of the buildings and the, the land when the rain comes out. So we're starting to see more extreme weather events with climate change. So Al Gore focuses a lot on that as well. So it was it was a really great conference to, um, you know, get re-energized, motivated, and, and working towards solutions when it comes to climate change. Were there uh, any other teachers out there you met? There was a handful of teachers, yeah. yeah. Um, some, believe it or not, from Massachusetts even, ah. and, um, yeah, and some others. So I got a list of folks that, you know, we're going to try to do some collaborations on in the, in the near future. Fantastic. So how do you network with other teachers? Primarily, I've found now it's um, teacher science um, institutes. So for instance, up in late August, I have a teacher training institute. I'll be teaching teachers for Boston Public Schools about climate change curriculum and ways that they can get involved. Um, I have some science teachers that want to get engaged in this. And believe it or not, I have some teachers that are not even in the realm of science that want to start incorporating climate change into their courses. That would be awesome. I mean, I can imagine like history teachers could do a lot. Huge. Yeah. You look at ice core records, you look at, you know, tree growth rings so you can see really you know connections that exist outside the science realm all right i am going to put on my gandalf hat (laughs) and say timothy if you could wave a magic wand and have one thing happen for your students for other teachers in the curricular world of climate science what would that be and what would you want out of it so good. Uh, I'm sorry. I got to ask a clarifying question. <laughs> do, uh, do you mean like magic wand in the education realm, or like solving climate change, or do so, you mean so something that would have a solutionist aspect, but in a world that you can engage with directly? So it could be other teachers. It could be a curriculum. It could be maybe the administration of the ed- of the school system. I want to give you two magic wands. I want the education one, and then I want the big world. The world one. one. Okay. okay. All right. That? Let's start with the small one, and then we'll so we'll do the magic wand and the magic stick. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then so if if I could have a magic wand for the education realm, I think it would be more funding and more time for teachers to work together because I feel like that's the important thing is is working on this fellowship I've been on for the past year and a half now two years it when you have dedicated and committed individuals who are focusing on the same topic and you give them time to work together you can come up with some pretty amazing results so I feel like if I was in a science department and I had some other teachers who were committed to work on something similar if we had time throughout the day to work together I think that would be a bit better and then also I think when it comes to public schools in general funding is always an issue Um, if we had smaller class sizes more teachers I think you would be able to you know provide a better education to teaching maybe 20 students per class as opposed to 31 right and now that we have done the magic wand. What about the magic tree? Like magic you know. tree. I think you'd have to go back, and this is just really defeatist and sad, and I apologize, but you'd have to change uh, humans. I feel like <laughs> inherently we're greedy, and inherently we crave power, and I think that is ultimately what has undone so many positive things that we have in society. You know, like if if we stopped putting money behind all the decisions we make and actually made decisions for an altruistic reason or for the betterment of mankind, I think we'd be a lot better off, you know. We, we oftentimes, like you can talk about policy in the United States around science right now and how disastrous it is, and it's primarily because of what we talked about earlier with the disinformation campaign with all the money coming from the fossil fuel industry. Yeah. So, so it's a big be nice stick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Timothy, for this wonderful time. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, been a pleasure. It's a real pleasure. And we're, uh, you know, we're really impressed by what you're doing and wish you, you know, all the, all the best in your, uh, 
in your future with this. And uh, let's hope that intern does some great work. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. So, Laura, Rajesh and I just had that great conversation with Timothy, and uh, you've been able to listen to it. What did you think? Oh, my God, I loved it. I, I, it was so interesting to me getting to hear that he's directly impacted the the futures of some of these students, you know, getting involved in, in college courses that are about environmental policy and things like that. That's fascinating. And the idea that in somewhere like the U.S. where educational legislation is so diverse that he's being able to bring teachers together all across the state and all across the country is so impressive to me. Yeah, it my is. hat's off to him. I'm um, taking on the, the public education kind of infrastructure in the United States with all the state frameworks and political <laughs> sort of energies flowing at it. It's, it's, a, it's a really important and a tall order. Totally. More power to him. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I was actually thinking about when he was talking about how until he kind of got into this role, there was so much disparity between at what age you learn about climate change. I remember my first school had a uh, a green council. So my seven-year-old little brother was on the green council talking about what kind of recycling initiatives our school would have. And yet other schools in the area and, you know, my friends wouldn't have done anything at all until they learned about CFCs in high school. Yeah. Maybe the... Um we didn't bring this up with Timothy, but there was a, a paper that was released last week to great fanfare about individual contributions, what we can do as individuals mm. to climate change and, and students' perceptions of it. This is the one that says, you know, recycling and changing light bulbs, the stuff that's talked about in your textbooks <laughs> actually have a, a, a almost invisible impact. And the things that really matter, living car free, yeah. not flying, especially long distances, and family planning uh, <laughs> are the are overwhelmingly the things that matter. And we'll put a link to that paper on the ClimateX website. So what do you think the big solutions are? We would love to hear from you. Yeah, it would be fantastic if you get in touch with us. Either we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we are on climatex.mit.edu. You can reach out to us all directly on the site as we're all members. And if you wanted to get in touch with us via email for any future podcasts, any questions you may have or that you'd like us to answer, you can get in touch with us at climatex underscore feedback at mit.edu. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Rajesh. Yeah. Goodbye. Another great week. Bye. ClimateX is powered by its active, diverse global community. Visit us at climatex.mit.edu and join the conversation.